Yeah. So, good evening, everybody. Hello. Yeah, boy. So, it's English here. Gaan het goed met allemaal? Ek is baie blij met hoor. So, uh, we're really honored to, great to have all of you here, but like I promised last time, uh, we've got our guest here tonight. Uh, Philip, I've been speaking about you for weeks now, and uh, <laughs> I wonder, you know, the... Um, I think they wondered, you know, whether you were really going to show up. But uh, anyway, here he is now. So let's just give uh, him and Juliet a right, nice round of applause. Uh, Juliet, where are you? There are you. Yeah, <laughs> that's his lovely wife. They, we, we got them in all the way from the Waterberg. And, and so thank, thank you so much for coming with Philip, Juliet. And thank you for, for bridging the distance. Uh, you know, it's a different Pleasure. country where you live <laughs> in the Waterberg. And uh, so thank you so much for being here. Um, so I'm going to just fire away immediately, saying something about Philip. He's a, like, like I said last time, he's a, um, he's a scientist. Um, he uh, did his first degree at Oxford University. Then he did a PhD in, I have to read this, because this is, he did a PhD in semiconductor optoelectronics. Okay, so what's that exactly? Basically, opto uh, optoelectronics is emitting and receiving light. So it's okay. making semiconductors that semiconductor lasers that emit light mm -hmm. and semiconductor detectors that detect light. Okay, so it's fairly simple then. Simple stuff. <laughs> just, just the basics. Just the basics. You know, <laughs> I think you do that with the Legos. So anyway. Mm -hmm. um, now, okay, well, great. So great to have you. And, and, and um, that you did at Sheffield University, right? Yeah. Okay. And so he published about 30 scientific articles in, you know, in, in mainstream journals, uh, scientific journals. And... Uh, and then he married a uh, South African girl. Uh, Juliet is, is South Africa, uh, born and bred. So, um, and, and so uh, you came to faith as well because of that, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> joking. Um, so just tell us a little bit about yourself, something that's not on your bio. We know you love God. Uh, we know you're a scientist in general. But what do you do at the moment? What do you do in the Waterberg? Why aren't you here in, Pretoria, in the nice town of Pretoria? Um, the Waterberg has a few special aspects that Pretoria can't offer. So um, <coughs> two of my passions are astronomy, which maybe we'll come into at some stage, mm -hmm. and another A, aardvarks. Wh what's again? Aardvark. Oh, oh. The most important, oh, ana most important <laughs> animal in Africa. Oh. And horrendously understudied. So yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing a scientific research, research project with Fitz on the role of the aardvark in the ecosystem. And oh, wow. I'm studying <coughs> the night sky, so the Waterberg's the perfect place to combine <laughs> those two. Okay. Both A's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, it's really great to have mm. you, and, and perhaps before we just, you know, fire away into the whole uh, topic or area of uh, science versus faith, um, how did you come to faith, uh, just briefly? Um, I grew up in a Christian home where the reality of God was was very obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents, you know, lived out the gospel in a very real way. Um, I think for many people, probably in a similar position, you, you come to a place where you've got to make it your own. Um, and I can remember a very significant event in my life um, when I was 12. Um, and then further significant events where I think I recommitted myself more deeply to the Lord. And then the, there was another very significant event on the 12th of April, 1992, long story behind that, but um, <clears throat> God really revealed his grace to me mm -hmm. and sort of blew me away by his amazing grace for even a sinner like me. And yeah, my faith has really just grown from there. Okay, <clears throat> okay. So, um, Philip, you, you know, like we all know now and we've anticipated tonight, uh, um, partly because of the fact that you're going to come as a scientist. And, and so we, we know that um, well, if someone told me 15 years ago that science and faith would be, you know, at odds again, I would sort of, you know, I wouldn't have believed you because I really saw postmodernism really rising and I thought, okay, you know, the whole thing about, you know, the, the, this tremendous uh, modern dualism, bec you know, between faith and um, science or the material and the immaterial, you know, is sort of passe. But here we are, here we are again, and uh, I've told you previously just when we had dinner that uh, this sometimes not a week go, goes by when a, f when a church member fo phones me and tells me that their teenager doesn't believe anymore mm. or that their uh, late teenager uh, you know, had gone to university. Uh, um, he or she might have grown up as a solid Christian in a church environment like this 
then they get a philosophy professor or, or, a, you know, or a biology professor that's an, that's an atheist. And then that boy or girl's faith uh, can be pulled to shreds and all of a sudden they don't believe anymore. And, and, and frequently, um, a, a lot of that time, th those times, it will be a matter of faith versus science. They felt compelled to choose between the so-called you know, you know, world of facts and world of faith or you know, some uh, atheists see that the world of fairy tale. Um, so I'm going to read you uh, this one quote by Sam Harris. And now Sam Harris is a very famous atheist. He's part of what we, you know, of the new atheist movement. And um, he just, so I'm just going to read it to you and just ask you to respond to this and, and give me your opinion from a, you know, from a scientific point of view. But I mean, you are a Christian, so we can't do away with the fact that you're also going to reason from, you know, from a Christian perspective, which is fine. A faith-seeking understanding, as, as Thomas Aquinas said. So uh, Sam Harris said the following. He said, science must destroy religion. So in the past, we had atheism that, uh, where the atheists weren't really that aggressive against religion and faith, right? But um, nowadays, as being expressed by Sam Harris, you know, science is the great thing. It has to destroy anything else that it opposes, and religion is one of those things. And then he also said, the conflict between science and religion is inerrant. Uh, sorry, between re religion and science is inerrant. Um, and then, of course, uh, one of his articles was titled Why Science and Faith Are Incompatible. So would you just elaborate on that a little bit and react? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm a great fan of Sam Harris, but mm. this is one point that I would disagree with him on. Actually, I'd love to have a chat with him about exactly why he is so vehemently antagonistic towards biblical faith in particular. Mm. Um, because in many ways it is bizarre, particularly if you consider the origins of modern science, because in a very real way, science is actually biblical faith's baby. It actually came out of biblical faith. Um, not just that if you look at almost all the early mm -hmm. practitioners of science, the people who really started <coughs> the modern process of science, they were all passionate Christians and gave a motivation for their Christianity, for their science coming from the Christianity. But if you actually look at why science started where and when it did, you can see a really strong role for biblical faith in that. Um, it's quite interesting. I mean, I suppose, first of all, define science. Well, one could say it's like this self-sustaining program of knowledge acquisition or something like that. It, mm, it's not mm. little bits and pieces of technology. It's something that, that starts and grows and builds upon itself and, and has produced the amazing fruit we have now. And why did that start in six, 16th century Europe? and not in other places. Because in many ways, Europe had been behind other parts of the world for a long time. Mm, mm. Um, there's an amazing guy called Joseph Needham. I don't know if you've heard of him, but if you want to look up an amazing life story, try Joseph Needham, absolutely extraordinary guy. And one of his biggest contributions to human knowledge was he became the world's most preeminent sinologist. During the Second World War, he did some amazing work in China, uncovering the riches of Chinese technological achievements, which had kind of gone unnoticed for many years. And there's amazing stories about how he was literally just hours ahead of the Japanese invading forces, mm. uh, saving relics, vital relics of, of Chinese sort of technology from, from the advancing Ch Japanese forces. But anyway, he wrote this 17-volume account of Chinese technological achievements. Gee. And what came out of that was the realization that well, if you take the big three technologies people talk about, gunpowder, the key to war, warfare, <coughs> the printing press, the key to communications, the, the compass, the key to navigation, on all three of those, China was about a thousand years ahead yeah. of Western yeah. Europe, you know? And so they developed this really cool technology and then it plateaued. It didn't produce the self-sustaining process of science. And Joseph Needham studied this and he was like, what happened? Why wow. didn't, like many other cultures around the world, but particularly looking at the Chinese, why didn't they produce modern science? Why did it emerge in, in 16th century Europe? And the conclusion he came to was that the Chinese Confucian worldview did not support a knowable God who, who had a rational way of implementing his will in the world. Basically, he said, if you look at the Confucian worldview, you would have no reason to expect 
a world of physical law mm. that was knowable by a scientist, and so you wouldn't go looking for it. And so you might develop these interesting technological artifacts, but you could never combine it to produce the self-sustaining process that is modern science. And then if you look at Western Europe, what happened there is, I think you had a lot of dry word of sort of stuff that had been passed on from the Greeks, etc., mm, and, mm. and from the Muslim world during the Middle Ages, but it wasn't going to catch light until the Bible was rediscovered. Um, Johannes Kepler, very amaz mm. amazing guy, he has this wonderful quote, which I'll, I'll paraphrase terribly, <coughs> but he says something like, the reason I do science, the reason I'm trying to look for physical law in the world is because I believe in a coherent, faithful lawgiver, and I believe that he has given us part of his mind, the mind of Christ, mm. and so we can understand his law. So his motivation for looking for physical law came directly from his understanding of the God of the Bible, which wow, wow. had recently been rediscovered because people suddenly had the, the Bible in their own language. You know, previously it had been locked up in a secret code of Latin only possessed by the priests, and now suddenly the secret was out. And yeah, people, it's available to everybody. Pe people were getting the yeah. hang of it, and they're saying, wow, this kind of God well, maybe we can look for order and structure in the universe. I know maybe that, it's that Isaac Newton said something on this, uh, in the same fashion, that he, he studied, he, he expected some rationality in nature, and the reason he studied it was because nature revealed something of God, and because he loved God, that was, you know, his love for God was actually his motivation for studying the, the material world mm. in order Absolutely. to understand more of God while studying it through scientific method. Is, is, and, and, uh, okay, so, so what's this guy's name again that did the comparison about the... the, the um uh, Joseph Needham. Joseph Needham, Joseph was, Needham. was the sinologist. Yeah, and, okay. and you're absolutely right. If you look at all, you know, Galileo, Kepler, um, <coughs> uh, Newton, mm. they, they make Max extensive Planck. reference mm. to mm. their motivation coming from their faith. Mm. And... Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's actually not an accurate quote of Kepler, but it kind of sums up his attitude. He said, I'm thinking God's thoughts after him. You know, oh, wow. That's yeah. what my science is. So they saw a complete harmony between what they were doing and, and loving God. And they actually, more than that, they saw the very process of science as being a gift mm. from a biblical worldview. So fundamentally, um, I'm afraid Sam's completely wrong. You know, it's not just that they're not incompatible. In actual fact, science um, depends entirely for its origins, well, sure. heavily for its origins okay. on, a bi on a biblical worldview. So, so we're going to get back to the origins of science later on. Um, but so why then do we have someone like uh, Richard Leonten, he's a, he's a geneticist, we, we all know about him, he said the following, he said, the problem is to get people to reject irrational and supernatural explanations, and he's referring there to religion and, and amongst other things, Christianity, the demons that exist only in their imaginations, and to accept a social and intellectual apparatus, science, as the only begetter of truth. Now, you've already uh, touched a little bit on this, but so he, he, he's, um, he's actually uh, you know, referring to scientism. So tell us a little bit about what, what scientism is, and why do you think we have these interesting yeah. you know, points of view? Yeah, I think, well, he summed it up quite well. It's, it's the, the view that the only true knowledge that can be gained about the world is through science, and particularly... That's that scientism, right? That's, that's not the scientism. same as science. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and particularly that any, any invocation of God in the process is somehow unnecessary and irrational. And I think what's quite interesting about a sort of scientific <coughs> view like this is actually how many scientists, even if they're not Christians, would actually criticize that view, and they'd say hey, you can't say that, you know, that you're going well, well beyond <coughs> the remit of science. You're actually bringing in your own personal philosophical prejudices. And I think, so you have to discuss that on a sort of philosophical presuppositional level. So um, what's Richard assuming there? First of all, he's taking as given mm. the fact we've got a universe. <coughs> you know, who ordered that? Why do we have something rather than nothing? Um, then he's assuming that we've got this... Um, physical universe governed by regularities. Why does that work? You know, Stephen Hawking famously said, I've, I've been working all the, with all these equations, but who breathed the fire into these equations? Mm. Why do they work? Why do they describe <coughs> a rational, functional universe? It's, it's not a given. It's, it's you actually, it's, if you don't believe in a God, it's like a brute fact that you have to parachute into your worldview. And then if you go even further, um, why do we have the type of universe we have? Um, this is one of my 
passions, it, the mm. fi fine tuning of the universe. It's extraordinary and um, quite shocking when you look at how finely tuned our universe is to produce life. And there's a whole discussion there which maybe we, yeah, we can sure. or can't go into, I don't know. <laughs> but um, when you look at all of that, you realize that he's actually making a whole vast number of assumptions that his scientific worldview can't justify. He just has to drop them in as a brute fact. Um, so the statement that, you know, the belief in, in a god who explains all of these inexplicable things in his worldview, that that's mm. irrational, that just doesn't make sense. He's actually making a whole load of assumptions that he's hidden under the carpet and hasn't really presented to, yeah. to his readership. And in actual fact, the explanation, we have a, a creator god who sought to create humans who he could relate to, actually makes a lot more sense of the world we see around us than the scientific worldview of scientism. And I think my guess would be, I mean, I don't want to be um, presumptuous here, but my guess would be what we're looking at here is somewhere along the line, someone like Richard has had various negative experiences <coughs> with Christians, with religion in general, or something like that, and that's being expressed in his choice of a worldview mm. because he's, he's kind of dealing with those issues. Um, okay, so what you're saying is this quote of his is much more an expression of his own presuppositions, his own story, and even perhaps his own bias yeah. against religion or, or, or whatever. It, yeah, it doesn't stand on a factual basis. I, I think it really is an expression of the presuppositions that he's got, which may well depend on the experience of life he's had. And, you know, in some ways, um, I've got a lot of sympathy for him because sometimes Christians can be... Um, the best evidence for the truth of the gospel, and sometimes we can be the worst <laughs> evidence. The worst. Um, and so sure. maybe, I, I remember, I mean, an absolute tragedy, um, E.O. Yeah. Wilson, some of you might have heard of, it just passed away, one of the greatest biologists of, the, biologists of the modern age. He was a Christian up to a certain age, and a very passionate Christian, but he was also passionate about science. And I think when he was about 13, he came to his pastor, and he said, um, Pastor, I'm just struggling with some of the things you've been teaching in church <laughs> and some of the science I'm beginning to learn, and I don't know how to put them together. Now, his pastor obviously got defensive, and he said, Ah, oh, young Wilson, you've just got to choose. It's either the Bible or science. And Wilson went, Science then, you know. Um, <laughs> of course. Completely false dichotomy. And yeah, I think sometimes yeah. um, the church, we, we've done that to people, and we've presented, we, we've played into the hands of scientists by saying, Yeah. It's science or faith, you know, and mm. you've got to choose. And the reality is it's absolutely not one or the other. I, I mean, if you talk to some, some really wonderful modern scientists who are Christians, people like uh, George Ellis, mm. maybe Dennis Alexander, Francis Collins from mm. the NIH, mm. they will all tell you that they can't imagine doing their science without their faith. Their, their knowledge of the creator is such a wonderful asset in understanding his creation. And I mean, when you put it like that, it's kind of, you can see how that works. And also, the knowledge of his creation helps them understand the creator. So they're far from being incompatible. They, have a, they see a wonderful synergy, and mm. I'd say the same. I mean, every time I do astronomy, um, it, it immediately connects with okay. my awe of the creator. Okay, okay. So one of the, um, one argument that I hear all the time is, you know, b because of the fact that science can explain more and more and more, the gap between, you know, knowing and not knowing, you know, is being bridged more and more. So we, uh, later on, we're not going to need God anymore because science is going to explain everything. And it's being expressed here, I must say, um, I just put in here to be a little naughty, uh, and this is Lee Strobel. Mm. He's an ex... Ex-atheist. Yeah. Uh, ex-atheist. Yeah. Ex <laughs> he's a Christian now. Yeah. But he used to he's say when he was... He's atheist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, a, yeah. he's a defector. <laughs> um, he, he, um, he said, when, I, when he was still an atheist, he said the following, I felt like I stared an unadorned Christianity in the face. I saw it for the dinosaur it was. Why could these people not get their head out of the sand and admit the obvious science had put their God out of a job. Now, this is what he thought before he came to faith, but there's still a lot of people using this argument, um, and perhaps you can just say a little bit about that, the whole God of the gaps uh, yeah. kind of thing, and, <coughs> you know, why do we still need God then um, mm. as an explanation? Gosh, there's so much you can say about that, but um, there's, 
One thing that I find really helpful, and it's actually a little story, and it's not original to me. It's actually, I think it's originally from Dorothy L. Sayers, but it, it came mm. to me via uh, Donald Mackay and via Ernest Lucas. And um, it goes a bit like this. So the story is about two people observing a flashing light out at sea. So these two people are walking on the beach at night, and they both see the same thing, this light flashing out at sea. Now, one of them is a professor of physics, and he's also a man who's always prepared. So he's got a backpack, and he's got a whole load of scientific instruments in his backpack. So he quickly whips out a spectrometer, and he observes the light, and he works out that that's a mission from a black body at 3,500 Kelvin being shone through a quartz filament, and through a quartz envelope, sorry, and he, he does a quick triangulation, and he works out that the light is 2.5 kilometers out to sea, and he quickly measures the frequency, and the average frequency of the flashes is 1.3 hertz. And he really feels he's done <laughs> a pretty comprehensive job in understanding the flashing light, and he goes home, has a cup of cocoa, and goes to bed. Okay? Now, the other person who's also on the beach <laughs> is not a scientist. Um, he's actually a waiter returning from waiting on tables, and he's taking a shortcut across the beach on his way home. Doesn't understand science at all. He also looks at the flashing light, and what he quickly recognizes is the light is flashing SOS. And he phones the Coast Guard, who are just in time to save the lives of the four fishermen whose ship has floundered on the rocks wow. at the sea. You see? Yeah. So you've got two very different accounts of the flashing yeah. light. Looking at the same thing. Looking at the same thing. The same thing. evidence. The same, same data. thing. Mm. Now, but very, very different. Now, which one's right and which one's wrong? Well, it's kind of obvious they're both right, but they're just looking at different aspects of the flashing light. So you know, the professor was looking at the how that the mechanism mm. of the flashing light, it was all, you know, Kelvins and Hertz and all that kind of thing, that the waiter was looking at the who and the why, the sort of help with sinking, <coughs> you know, save our souls kind of thing. And they're both true. Now, probably if you're the fisherman, you'd be more interested in the waiter, you know, spotting your message than the professor. <laughs> but th th they're both equally valid. And I think course, in, a, yeah. in a lot of knowledge, and particularly looking at the natural world around us, um, you can look at the how, the mechanism, and that's, that's science. That's really exciting. I, I love that. But you can also look at the who and the why. You know? So we look at this universe, we can look at the mechanism by which it develops and all that kind of thing. Yeah. But that does not answer the question, who made it, who sustains it, why is it there, uh, and why did they make it, for what purpose? Um, just to give you another silly example of a personal nature. So um, the 2nd of September 1989 was a very significant day in my life. Okay? Um, and I'm going to describe it to you in terms of mechanism, and in terms of meaning, and mm. you can just tell me which one is the most useful to you, okay? okay. So, <clears throat> on the 2nd of September, my adrenaline levels soared, okay? My norepinephrine levels soared, my serotonin levels dropped, and my blood pressure and my heart rate were raised. So, hopefully that's very good. Meaningful. Give, very yeah, meaningful. Very meaningful. given you a full picture. That's good okay. devotional stuff, doing that's a quiet time with that. I think that's really that, cool. That's a mechanism description of what happened. <laughs> I could give you a meaning description of what happened. On the 2nd of September, 1989, I met a certain Juliet Baber who I fell head over heels in love with. Um, and, you know, and they're both accurate, but the meaning one is, is more useful mm. and appropriate in understanding what happened to me. Sure. And so, you know, we can live our entire life without understanding the mechanisms of how the human body works. You know, mm. people have for a long time. Sure. But I don't think we can live a meaningful life without understanding who made our bodies and why, because that's all about our meaning and purpose. So, and science can't answer that. Science doesn't attempt to, a good scientist will say, that's just not within the remit of science. That's not a question mm. science wants to deal with or can deal with. Um, to understand that, you're gonna have to look at philosophy and the Bible, because it does yeah. deal with those yeah. questions. Now, now, that's an important thing, uh, and we're going to, again, we're going to get to that later on more extensively, but, um, so, so is science, and of course, when you talk about science tonight, we're talking about uh, uh, natural science, right? We're not talking about the, the humanities, necessarily. Um, but um, the, the, the tools that science uses are tools that cannot, that cannot measure m Metaphysicality, it can, it can only measure ma the material world, right? So, so, so uh, it, it can only ask or answer the what question. You no, know, mm. what is this? Mm. How does it operate? But it cannot ask the why behind it. Now, that's a significant thing because Anthony Flew, uh, who came to faith, said a very significant thing that, that we, the moment you ask, you know, uh, or look at the, how to sub 
atomic particles are interacting, you're looking at science. The moment you ask why they do that, it's philosophy. It's not science anymore. So strictly speaking, mm. science is not geared to answer the God question at all. Absolutely. Am absolutely. I right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can really say science is just uncovering how, from a Christian perspective, how God did it. And, and it can only ever do that. It's just um, an explanation of the, of the mechanism he chose and used yeah. to bring this all into being. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. If you look at science, um, science derives its power from limiting its scope. So it says we're not going to study everything. We're going to study what's measurable, what's repeatable, and what's observer independent, which is great. And that, that gives it tremendous power by limiting its focus. Yeah. But large amounts of life don't fit into that. You know, relationships and love and, of course, our relationship to our creator are not within that box. So there's nothing wrong with science, but if you're a scientist and you say scientism if you go with scientism route and say, it's everything, there's nothing but science and everything else must bow the knee to science, you're making a real sort of category error in, in your definition of, in your, the way you look at knowledge, basically. And category error is the most profound kind of error you can make in determining <laughs> yeah. reality because if you, if you confuse the categories that are supposed to be studied by science um, and you confuse that with metaphysical realities like God, it, that's a very, very big detrimental mistake. I still remember that, that um, the, mathem the mathematician John Lennox, uh, that you know, uses the same kind of metaphor, but in a different way. He uses the Henry Ford metaphor and, and uh, mechanical engineering. You know, how did, the f you know, how did cars develop? Was it mechanical engineering or was it Henry Ford? Hmm. And of course, it's both. It's both. Uh, yeah. But mechanical engineering <coughs> is the mechanism that you used, but, I but, but even a mechanism needs an agent. And Ford is the agent. The, engineer, the engineering can do nothing without the agent. And, and I think he referred in that sense to evolution. If evolution were to be true, um, you know, it, it might have been the mechanism that God used, but Absolutely. it still doesn't answer uh, the origin of life. It only answers what happens when life develops from simple to complex organisms, right? Absolutely, so, yeah. So it's much the same. I, I, I've never heard that one about the flashlights. It, it, it is really, really good. Yeah, I, I, I won't forget that. Okay. Um, oh wow! Okay, so 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 that's really profound. Um, uh, so, would you like to s to add something still on the next quote that Sam Harris said? Christianity is uncontaminated by evidence. So yeah. you've um, you've alluded earlier to uh, the fine tuning of the universe. So when we really talk about evidence, then now of course evidence you talk about um, science only use well you know, use the whole thing of observation. So wh wh what what kind of evidence? Is there, and you don't have to give everything now because we, again, we, we're going to conclude with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so <coughs> just in short, how would you respond to uh, to, to Harris there? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really puzzled by him saying that because he must be aware of some of the evidence that Christians use to support their faith. So, it's, I'd love to ask him why he chooses that that way of attacking Christianity because it doesn't really make much sense. Um, I would say there's two sort of categories of evidence that one could look at. The first, a sort of natural theology a sort of set of evidence that strongly suggests that we live in a, a universe that was created, but actually doesn't necessarily tell us anything much about the creator. So I think there's a lot of evidence along that. You talked mm -hmm. about the fine-tuning of the universe. There's, there's all sorts of things that we look around the universe and it's not compatible with a physical-only view of the universe. So I was actually having a discussion with a very, um, very clever um, Oxford lecturer just over Zoom just a few days ago, and we had a lovely discussion, and we were talking about morality, and he's actually, um, his era of study is practical moral philosophy, is what he, mm. he, he's studying, and we were talking about how to construct some kind of moral framework for the, for the world, and he was talking about all these things, and you know, agent neutral this behind a golden veil and whatever, and it all sounded very good, and I said, but look, Everything you've said is based on the presupposition of the value and importance of human life. Mm. A and where do you get that from a physical only view? If we're just atoms and molecules, why is that little child who's maybe malnourished in India, why do I have a moral imperative, which we all acknowledge we do, to care about him? He's just atoms and molecules. Yeah, why is I'm he just important? atoms and molecules. You, know? mm. you, you end up with, on that basis, you end up with 
the quote that Richard Dawkins has used again and again. You know, he said, in a, in a universe of nothing but atoms and molecules and selfish genes, there will be no good, no evil, no right, no wrong, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. He's a cheerful chap. Um, <laughs> really and, yeah, yeah. and he says, I'd like to have dinner with him. <laughs> That's exactly the universe we observe, he says. Yeah. But of course it isn't. That isn't the universe we observe. We know inside that every human has value. And why do we know that? We know that because Genesis 1, we're made in God's image. And that, mm. that is why people are valuable. And I was talking to this friend and I was saying, look, how can you construct on the premises, on the premise that we're just atoms and molecules, please show me the logical steps when you end up with the value of a human. Mm. And he just went quiet. He just like hadn't really thought of that before, you know, um, because you can't do it. You can't do it. Actually, when you try and construct moral philosophy, you parachute in concepts from actually your Judeo-Christian heritage that people are yeah. fundamentally valuable because they were made in the image of God. So the evidence of our moral conscience and the fact we know people we're not related to and are never going to do any good for us are still valuable yeah. and we still owe them a duty of, of love. Um, that is, is something that's incompatible with a physicalist only universe. So mm. uh, and there's a whole string of things like this. I mean, one of my favorites, my poor wife is completely bored of me talking about this, but <laughs> um, human consciousness, subjective experience. Mm. You know, I went to a conference in Interlaken in Switzerland on the science of consciousness, where you had all the top people from around the world um, trying to come up with scientific explanations, basically on a physicalist basis, of how humans have subjective experience, by which I mean you know, the redness of red, the smell of lavender, the feeling of pain, how does that arise from purely neuronal activity in our brain? You know, you can explain how our brain processes data. You know, we get inputs from our senses, it processes the data, we get outputs in terms of our motor neurons. But why doesn't that go on in the dark? Why is there like a movie playing in our head? Why are we experiencing this, consci this, this conscious perception, these subjective um, experiences? And... Um, the, the most eminent professor in the whole field of this is a guy called David Chalmers, who probably many of you heard of. Mm. Um, he really started the field Consciousness 25 years studies. ago. Yeah, mm. started the field 25 years ago. And he was there at the conference, and I, I bent his ear, and I, and I said to him, you know, David, which of the various theories of consciousness do, do you favor most? And he said, the one I heard longest ago, because it's given me time to forget all the flaws in it. Um, <laughs> because... Basically, they don't work. None on a f purely physicalist basis. Yeah. If there's not a human soul, it's really, really difficult. Well, it's not just really difficult. It's actually proven impossible to explain where human consciousness comes from. Um, and the whole, the whole conference was basically either we don't know or it just is, get used to it kind of mm. thing because nobody was able to come up with a physicalist explanation. Yeah. So just the sheer <coughs> physicality of the world does really suggest that the evidence from the universe around us does suggest there's more than just atoms and molecules. There's a spiritual element to our world. Now, it doesn't tell us anything about the nature of that spiritual Sure, world. of course. For that, yeah. I would look at things like, well, primary, above everything, the evidence of the resurrection I find utterly compelling, mm. that mm. Jesus was who he said he was, okay. the Son of God. So, so before we get to that, uh, um, I still remember the, the, the famous atheist, uh, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, we said it earlier while, while we were having dinner as well, that um, he says that all the intelligence that we gathered through the f last few you know, centuries is all to do with brain work and brain capacity and neuroscience. But when it comes to consciousness, we have, we have made absolutely no progress. The more we study, the less we know. And, and so he, he's very adamant that we have no souls. But if we don't have a soul, at least explain consciousness then, mm -hmm. um, which, of course, is, is, is very, very difficult. Just to come back to that whole, whole morality thing, I had an argument or discussion a, a while back with, uh, with, with a non-believer that said to me, but of course science uh, can tell us something about morality. You know, it shows us that we have morality. And, and I said, yes, yes, yes. Um, science can show us that we have the, that there's a moral phenomenon among humans, right? But it can do nothing, prove nothing about moral obligation. In other words, that um, yes, we, Science can tell us we, we're probably going to care about that little kid in India, but it doesn't show us that we need to you know, It doesn't care. explain why we do. Yeah, why yes, and why we need to, to care. I, I often use the analogy, it's, it's quite African-based, but it's also quite brutal. But um, you know, prides of lions, they, they operate in 
ways that fortunately humans don't. But um, what happens is you'll get a bunch of males um, will take over the females in a pride and kick the existing males out. And when they do that, the first thing they do... Sounds like the eastern side of Pretoria. <laughs> <laughs> Hope, hopefully not. Because the first thing yeah, they do nah, is not, they so. go and kill all the offspring of the nursing mothers. Now, why do they do that? Wow, yeah. They do that because that makes perfect sense under natural selection. Because mm. th they have no genetic investment in those offspring. Those offspring are using up resources from the females. They're present preventing the females becoming fertile again while they're nursing them. So it makes complete sense. Kill the babies, you know. Um, but in a human context, we would regard that as a horrendous evil. And why? Why do we do that? Because we know, at a fundamental level, we are different. We are made in the image of God. And mm. it's only the Bible, it's only a biblical worldview. It's only the Creator Himself telling us, really, that gives us that understanding. You, you can't get it from a, just a physicalist view. You just get survival of the fittest. You just get kill the cubs. You yeah. know, that makes perfect sense. Um, look after the cubs makes absolutely <laughs> zero sense um, from a purely physicalist point of view. Just one more thing on, on the whole morality thing. Um, uh, Sharon Street is a non-believing, I think she's an agnostic or an atheist philosopher, and she wrote an article entitled uh, A Darwinian Dilemma for Realist Theories of Value. And what she argued in the whole thing is how exasperated and um, desperate she was when she, when, when she went to Ethiopia and she saw uh, the people in the culture circumcise uh, little girls, uh, baby girls. And of course, it's a complete mutilation of, you know, of, of their bodies and so on. And, and she, you know, she, she absolutely rebelled against that and tried to convince these people not to do that. And their only, you know, their the, 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 the resistance was, but listen, you're a Westerner, what do you know? This is our culture. We know how our culture works. Go, go back to your Western culture and do what you want to do. But here, you, know, you have no moral authority to come and tell us what we can or cannot do. And then she realized, and she's still an atheist as far as I know, but she realized that you can actually make no moral claim you know, on a simply purely Darwinian level without, you know, without a moral creator that has some kind of authority. Um, mm. Well, I, I think, you know, it's the problem of relativist morals. If you don't have a moral giver outside of our sphere, yeah, yeah. you're left with a relativist view. And, uh, I mean, exactly what you say, I, I, I experienced this a little bit when talking to my daughter Lucy, who she, um, she did something, I think if we knew what she was going to get up to, we would have never, ever let her go there. But she went, <laughs> she went to Cambodia, and she worked in the slums um, with a group called Daughters of Cambodia, and they were rescuing... Um, children who'd been trafficked into the sex trade by their parents. They'd been sold as prostitutes by their parents. And it was totally hectic because, you know, obviously the pimps weren't very keen on having their, mm. their, uh, their prostitutes rescued, and there was all sorts of issues and, and dengue fever and, you know, bodies floating past in the river. And it was just absolutely hectic. And um, um, Lucy almost got trafficked herself, which was also insanely hectic. Um, and... Um, it, it was a very eye-opening experience for her. She really learned to pray um, because it was just <laughs> like, it was a daily matter of, of survival, really. Um, and but one thing that really puzzled her initially was in interacting with these young girls, none of them had surnames. And she inquired as to why this was. And the reason was, of course, they'd just come through Pol Pot's killing fields. And Pol Pot had an atheist philosophy in which there wasn't a fundamental value on human beings. What was valuable was the state. Mm. And the state was the vehicle by which utopia was going to be introduced to Cambodia. Yeah. And he had this idea that Cambodia must be returned to a sort of agrarian only stone age. And all new people, as he called them, were counter revolutionaries pushing back against this change, whether they were or not. And so anyone who was seen as a new person, for example, wearing glasses, would be you would be classified as a new person, being able to speak a foreign language being seen reading a book, anything like that, you're a new person, you must be killed. You just had to get out of the way of his wonderful um, Marxist utopia that he was bringing mm. in. But it wasn't just you he wanted to get out of the way. He would take out the whole family because he, he realized, you know, taking out one might leave behind angry relatives. Yeah, relatives so yeah. that's why they dumped surnames because you just didn't want to, anyone to be able to know which family you were associated with. It was absolutely chilling. But on a relativist Morality, how can we actually say what he was doing was wrong? 
You know, he made a genuine, possibly, I mean, he may not have, but he could have made a genuine moral choice that this was the right way for the Cambodian this state. This is how nature works, anyway. Yeah, a- and he's going to bring in utopia, and it's going to be good for everyone. And yeah, you know, you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs, and those new people, they're counter-revolutionaries, they're spoiling the utopia, they must be removed. And why is that wrong? It's only wrong because God says... No, it's wrong that people have a fundamental value. And, mm. and we, as you say, we can't come and say, nah, nah, we, we know that you're, you're wrong. You can turn to us and say, why? I've constructed my own relative morality, and in my relative morality, this is right. And it's going to okay. bring about a good for the whole state of Cambodia. So I think, yeah, there's a very, very strong argument you can make that relative morality falls to pieces, that you need an absolute morality. And if you've got an absolute morality, you've really got to have an absolute moral giver because otherwise, where does it come from? Mm, mm. Wow. Okay, well, uh, um, thank you very much for that. And I th- um, uh, let's move to a, a next quote because I'm, I can already see we can uh, carry on like this you know, for the whole evening. Um, the famous atheist Richard Dawkins, p- famous for his, you know, the God Delusion book, uh, said the following, just thinking a little bit about the definition of faith and then, you know, in its relation to science. He said, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, lack of evidence. So he opposes the two, you know, science is the world of faith. Faith is what you do that when you want to believe in something but have absolutely no evidence. So let's talk a little bit about the definition of faith. Right. Uh, the definition of faith, um, I mean, I would go with something like biblical faith is trust in Jesus Christ on the basis of the evidence that we've acquired about who he is. So it, it's exactly the opposite of what Richard Dawkins says. It's not this blind leap of faith. That's just not how it works. Um, it's trusting him, often in circumstances where, you know, Seemingly, sometimes circumstances can suggest we shouldn't be trusting him, but we know he's trustworthy mm. for very good reasons based on evidence. So, you know, this is where, again, I'd come back to the, the evidence of the resurrection. For me, is very strong evidence that Jesus was who he said he was, and hence is a God, and B, is a loving God because mm. he came to die for us. But I think as a Christian, you know, we can go a lot further than that. Um, I can look at watching the work of God in people's lives. And I I can see some of my friends who, uh, one of our very, very good friends now, I really didn't like him at all. (laughs) I really didn't get on with him. And he had an amazing encounter with the Lord. And now (laughs) he's like one of our heroes. Uh, He's just, you can just see how the Lord has transformed his life in amazing ways, you know. And and also, the power of Scripture, um, I've, I mean, it's not just issues of biblical prophecy, which obviously a really exciting, you know, Psalm 22, Isaiah mm. 53, these things are really quite amazing. But it's just the actual power of Scripture in my life that I've experienced. You know, the Bible says it's living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And I've experienced that, that actual fact, the Bible is more than just advice. It's actually spiritual power in our life. And so that, to me, is, is very strong evidence that, that um, the Bible is something powerful delivered to us by God. Um, Mm, mm. So there's a whole range of evidences, but I would come back to the primary one, the objective evidence for the resurrection, which I think is very, very strong. It's difficult. Well, it's not just difficult. It's incredibly difficult to come up with any sensible explanation of what happened in first century uh, Palestine and later across the whole Middle East um, and the Roman world without having to factor in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, there's an amazing book uh, which I would recommend to all of you to read called, called Freakonomics by a guy called Stephen Levitz. Um, and he says it's about economics. It's not. It's actually about statistics. But even more than that, what it's <laughs> actually about, it's about looking at human motivation. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's just a great book. What he, he, he does is he picks apart various situations in human life. And he, he basically shows if you can find out what people's motivations are, you can predict their behavior. And he comes up with some extraordinary examples which would completely boggle your mind that you wouldn't have expected, but you followed it. Ah, I can see this motivate led to this behavior. And if you look at the disciples and you look at their motivation, pre the crucifixion, 
you can make sense of their motivation in following Jesus. You know, there, there was status, there was power. He potentially was this Messiah who was going to kick out the Romans, establish the kingdom of God. They might have powerful positions in this new kingdom. He was an attractive, charismatic guy. He was doing miracles. He was feeding the 5,000. Wow. You know, it, okay, there may be a mm. bit of risk. They were running into trouble with the original authorities, but it, you can w- make a very good case for their motivation to follow Jesus. And then Jesus is crucified as a criminal. You know, and all of their expectations are more than dashed. Um, there was going to be no kingdom in which they were going to be Jesus' lieutenants. Suddenly, it's just a whole pile of negatives. I mean, why, what on earth was in favor of standing up and saying, I've seen the risen Jesus Christ, and you can do whatever you want to me. I won't, won't, can't deny that fact. They had nothing positive to expect. They were going to get persecuted by the Romans, mm. persecuted by the Jews. They're going to lose their status and place in community. Undoubtedly, they were going to end up probably dead, uh, which, of course, I think 11 out of the 12 yep. did, and John end up, uh, ended up in prison. So mm. there was no motivation um, to say, to make up a lie and stand up for that lie and basically suffer and get killed. It just doesn't make any sense. The only explanation that can explain this extraordinary transformation from the cowards who fled in the Garden of Gethsemane to the people who would stand in front of the temple courts and say, yeah, you can flog us if you like, you can crucify us if you like, we cannot deny we have seen and touched the risen Christ. You know, he rose from the dead completely against our expectation. We did not have that in our minds at all, but we've seen it and we've touched it and it's real and we'll die for it now. So I, I really can't see any other way of explaining the disciples and, of course, the explosion of the early church other than that Jesus really rose from the dead. And I think the only reason people really reject that is they have the presupposition of physicalism. So Mm. people don't rise from the dead because there isn't a God. But wait a sec, if we step back, we can actually see the God hypothesis actually explains the natural world, some of the things we were talking about, Mm. a lot better than Mm. the no-God hypothesis. So one shouldn't come to the question with the assumption people don't rise from the dead because there's no God, that should be an open question because it's equally possible. The physicalist world, of course, people don't rise from the dead. But if we have a creator God who came in person, then yeah, he would have the power to be raised from the dead. Um, so once one takes that objection out of the way, the historical evidence yeah. is screaming at us that that's what happened. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's very true. And I think you know, the strongest set of uh, you know, evidence I think that Christianity really has is the historical evidence when it comes to the you know Jesus as an actual person that lived, and of course his 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 resurrection, and a lot of people come to faith, uh, even though you know they don't really buy into the fine fine tuning of the universe, say for instance, or anything. They study the resurrection and the historical evidence, Absolutely. and and because of that, they started believing in God. That God, the existence of God, would be the best explanation for what happened there. I I think of and I think by the way, I think your whole idea of motivation is very very good because. Um, that, that that's why you can't compare the disciples that saw Jesus afterwards and their martyrdom, for instance, with a, um, a suicide, you know, bomber, uh, because uh, people have pointed that out to me. But listen, yeah, but that's typical of you fanatics. You know, you 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 strip vests on you and you go and you blow up a building, you know, or whatever. But you have to understand the difference. Mm. The suicide bomber really, truly believes mm. that when he dies here, yeah, he's going to end up virgins. in heaven. And yeah, yeah, yeah. and 72 virgins is going to meet yeah. him. What they've done to deserve that, I don't know. You know. <laughs> but um, yeah. uh, that would happen. But the disciples, if they uh, spread the story that Jesus rose from the dead, they would have known that that, yeah. that should be a lie. Because exactly. uh, they would have who, who dies for their own lie, basically. Exactly, who no. dies for their own lie. I mean, yeah. if I was involved, yeah. and they would put a, you know, a pilum, you know, or a spear to my throat, I would go, <laughs> guys, joke, joke, joke. There's his body, go and fetch it, you know. It's, 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 um, but nobody said that. Yeah. Uh, the Roman Empire could have, uh, you know, ab- obliterated Christianity within, you know, one day. Just find Jesus' corpse, mm. put it in a wagon, and drag it through the main street of Jerusalem, and it's, you know, and it's all gone. They couldn't find it. Mm. And, and uh, so... That's really very, very strong. And perhaps, you know, one evening we'll talk just about the, resur- about the resurrection because it's, it's, it's really, it's worth really yeah. very strong. Um, one, one thing that's also very amazing to me is all four Gospels 
uh, testify that the woman discovered the mm. empty grave, right? And if you it's were... It's not how you'd make up a story. No. <laughs> if you would have made up a story, you would never write it that, Sorry, women, that a woman... Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, we, we apologize <laughs> for the patriarchal community that those people lived in. But, I mean, you know, th th they would have never invented a story like that. A woman in those days weren't allowed even to testify in court uh, because they weren't, you know, considered to be trustworthy. Now, mm. to, to today we mean, you know, we know the opposite. They're much cleverer than us, you know. Um, but... Uh, the, 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 um, and all four, go all four Gospels stick with the woman that discovered the empty tomb. Why would they do that? Probably because they remembered what actually happened. Mm -hmm. It was, it, it, it were women mm -hmm. that discovered the empty tomb. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really the only explanation. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, you, you know that embarrassment is one of the historical criteria, you know, to establish whether, whether a historical document is really true to its own source is if it embarrasses you, uh, but you still wrote that, uh, that's probably true then. Uh, I know. And, and so for, for the early church, the women were really an embarrassment uh, mm -hmm. from, a, from a historical perspective. Yeah. But they stuck to the women because that's what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And um, no, no, so, so, so thank you for that. Um, so let's, let's ask three questions. Um, uh, we've already touched a little bit on the... Um, the historic, you know, the origin of modern science, but I think it's still a very, very strong, uh, you know, or compelling thing to talk about because if we, if science and faith, you know, should be, you know, in such opposition as people claim it should be, um, let's just look again at the origin of, um, you know, the modern science and, and let's elaborate on one specific example because examples like this, uh, you know, are always, you know, uh, are always brought up, and that is the whole Galileo, you know, Galileo episode, you know, where, yeah, you see, you Christians, you were always against knowledge. Here comes a guy, Galileo, he tells you, listen, you know, the earth is right, well, he wasn't the first, I mean, Copernicus was, was before him, but, mm. uh, and, and, you know... The Galileo produced the evidence that yeah, uh, really confirmed the, the Copernican model. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and so, yeah, and the church, you know, threw him out, and, he, you know, and he wasn't, and so, so... Mm. What happened there? Yeah, it's a very interesting example. Actually, um, this is why, again, I'd love to talk to Sam Harris actually about this because he rails against religion. And when it comes to legalistic religion, I agree with him because, you know, something that I find very illuminating is the question of who killed Jesus? Who put him on the cross? It was the religious authorities. Mm. And in actual mm. fact, legalistic religion has always been opposed to the work of God. I mean, you listen to... Stephen's um, message when he's getting stoned. You know, you've always persecuted the prophets. You've always killed God's messengers. Now you've killed his very own son who came, mm. you know. Mm. And religion, in the <laughs> sense of following legalistic rules, I think is dire and, and it produces all sorts of evils. Um, because the idea that by obeying rules, we can earn our way to heaven is so fundamentally flawed. Mm. Um, we can't. We can't keep all the rules. So I think if we try, if you create a, a religious hierarchy trying to keep the rules, a religious system trying to keep the rules, what you end up with is disappointment and guilt because nobody can do it. And so they're, they're feeling guilty, and then they look around at other people who aren't even trying, and one way of expunging your guilt is to take it out on those infidels Mm. of whatever religion it is, <laughs> who are not even trying to keep the rules which you're failing to do. And so it naturally leads to quite outrageous stuff. Plus, you combine that with the natural fact in hum human nature that power corrupts absolute power co corrupts absolutely. So these religious hierarchies will become monsters. And mm. that's certainly mm. exactly what happened at the time of Jesus. It's what had happened at the time of Galileo. I mean, tragically, at the time of Galileo, it was an offense punishable by death to have a Bible in your own language. You know, that can't be right. Something's gone <laughs> wrong there. Um, mm. So what you're looking at is the religious authorities exerting their power, trying to keep their place, trying to stop dissent, and Galileo is just an inconvenient little gnat you know, annoying them. I mean, yeah. he also kind of, damage kind, of kind of messed it up by, by making fun of, of Pope Innocent, which kind of wasn't clever. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's actually not the Christianity of Jesus that in any way persecuted Galileo. I mean, Galileo had a strong faith, and he yep. expressed it time and time again. Um, 
But the religious authorities at the time were not following Jesus. They were doing legalistic religion, and it can be, you know, legalistic Christianity, legalistic Islam, legalistic Buddhism. It doesn't really matter. It, it, it always looks really bad, and it always results yeah. in bad things happening. And, and that's what Jesus came to overthrow. Yeah. I mean, it's no mistake that the only group of people he had harsh things for to say were the religious authorities. You know, he didn't have harsh things to say <coughs> about the prostitutes and the tax collectors and total outcasts mm. within the Jewish community, you know, collaborating with the Romans. Didn't have harsh things to say about them. He only had condemnation for the religious authorities who, you know, were laying a heavy burden on people that they themselves couldn't carry. You know, they were blocking people from entering the kingdom of God. They wouldn't go in themselves. They wouldn't let anyone else. He, he really had a problem with legalistic religion. Sure, sure. Uh, th that is so true. And so, so in other words, we wouldn't have to be taken up with, you know, fellow Christians in history that, that, that really, well, you know, if they were really Christians or followers of Jesus anyway, which they, pro you know, most of them or some of them probably might, might not have been um, because people will always abuse, you know, religious people will always abuse their own religion to get their own way. What's very interesting also, though, is that in his letter to the, the Duchess of Tuscany, he, uh, Galileo revealed that it was not initially the church. They were obviously, like you said, you know, taken up you know, by the whole thing, but it was actually initially the Aristotelian philosophers that were upset because of the fact that he overturned their Aristotelian yeah, worldview. And then they went to the church, again, abusing the church. Listen, you know, Galileo mm. is saying this and this and this. Let's take him on. Because the, the whole church theology of the day was also based... On, on the, the Aristotelian worldview. Uh, yeah. world yeah. yeah. they, they were heavily invested in it. There, there's a, a wonderful quote from a, a Jesuit called, I think it was Father Inkoffer. And he, he, he said this, he said, the idea that the earth moves, which of course, you know, goes around the sun, is the most despicable of all heresies. It is better to disbelieve in the incarnation, the existence of God, and the immortality of the soul than to disbelieve that the earth is stationary. <laughs> <laughs> well, something had gone wrong. He, he, he felt quite he'd, serious he'd, about it. <laughs> yeah, he'd really got caught up with re yeah. with religion and and with legalism, and you know, he persecuted Galileo out of that, um, not out of following Jesus Christ. Okay, I just want to end you know this whole question with one quote uh, by Colin Russell, a professor of uh, evolutionary biology, biology, I think, at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he said concerning the historical, you know. Uh, conflict between religion and science. He says, the common belief that the actual relations between religion and science over the last few centuries have been marked by deep and enduring hostility is not only historically inaccurate, but actually a caricature so grotesque that what needs to be explained is how it could have possibly achieved any degree of respectability. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's, that's quite accurate. Um, I mean, the whole idea of the conflict metaphor is surprisingly recent. Mm. You know, if you look... For example, at issues of the age of the earth, mm. um, a lot of the people who did the geology were Christian ministers, you know, and they came to the conclusion, looking at all these layers of rocks, the earth was really old, and they saw no incompatibility between that and their understanding of Genesis. Wow. It was actually... I didn't know that. Yeah, mm. you know, that, that, that in, in those days, Christian ministers had a lot of time on their hands, you know. Sure. So that, that, that only that, worked on Sunday, that's changed. much like today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they didn't even do that sometimes. Um, <laughs> and, and so they, they went around digging stuff and, and looking at rocks. Um, and, uh, you know, the conflict thing really is a relatively recent uh, innovation. And wow. you can trace yeah. a lot of it to Ellen White, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventists. You know, she had visions and wrote uh, documents which she claimed were actually as authoritative as Scripture, in fact, were more authoritative than Scripture, a sort of classic example of actually kind of a cult-like thing. And, um, and in her revelations uh, was the idea that you had to interpret six days of creation as six periods of 24 hours, and you had to believe that the Earth was 6,000 years old. Um, which we can discuss how biblical scholars review that, because the vast majority of biblical scholars will say that's not a particularly accurate interpretation of Genesis. It's a possible one, mm. but it's not the most favored one by biblical scholars. But anyway, she was deeply committed to that through her, her revelations she had received from God, and she promulgated this in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And it was picked up by a very interesting gentleman called George McCready Price. I'm sure some of you have heard of him. He was a primary school teacher in the US in the early 20th century. No scientific training at all. 
Um, but he got really excited about the idea of flood geology, that all the rocks could be explained by a global flood. And he started producing these pamphlets and writing these books, which did not receive a lot of positive assent from the mm. church at that mm. stage. But then in the 60s, you got George Whitcomb and Henry Morris, and they wrote the Genesis Flood. Oh, yeah. And they gave it a sort of um, semblance of scientific credibility, even though ni neither of them were scientists. You had an engineer and a theologian. But um, that idea gained a lot of credibility. And then that was a key step in setting up the sort of conflict metaphor between science and faith, mm -hmm. because um, the idea that all the rocks can be explained by a flood is really, really problematic from a scientific yeah. basis. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, just to give you one simple example, um, the Green Valley shale deposits in the States, there's very interesting to people at the moment because they contain uh, gas and oil that can be fracked. There's actually more oil deposits in these shale than in the whole of Saudi Arabia, if you could get it all out, but you can't. You can only get about 10% out. But anyway, lots of interest in this. And when you look at these shale deposits, what you see is a whole series of layers that were laid down year upon year. They're called varves. Basically, in the summer, in a lake, you get a, a, an organic rich layer of sediment because there's more stuff alive. Mm. And in the winter, you get a, white, a whiter, lighter, um, mostly mineral deposit. And you get these two, lay two layers every year. And if you look at the Green uh, Valley Shale, or Green River Shale, I can't remember the exact name, you see six and a half million annual layers deposited hmm. in beautiful order with no evidence of an obvious global flood in between. So sure. um, there's strong evidence that the Earth is old, and the idea that all the rocks were formed in some catastrophic flood really is very, very problematic and, and unnecessary if you talk to biblical scholars. Yeah, it's exactly. unnecessary to invoke that. So I think this book, The Genesis Flood, um, was very well received by a lot of of, of churches over time. Um, and, well, initially, actually, the American Scientific Affiliation, which was the Association of American Christian Scientists, they wanted nothing to do with it. They said, no, this is <laughs> it's not, not biblical what you're saying, not scientific, please go and do it somewhere else, uh, which he did. But it gradually got a momentum of its own, and some very loud voices have promulgated that. And I think scientists have pushed back against that. Um, and that has been, and then you've had the new atheist scientism mm. also sort of, so it's, it's led to a severe confrontation that fits in now to the, the culture wars in the States, but I think is in, entirely gratuitous and unnecessary yeah. from both sides. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so that really brings us to a very important point, I think, and that is, um, you know, what was our contribution as Christians to this whole conflict mm. metaphor? And perhaps then the second question, is there any other possible reasons for the conflict between science and faith besides the intellectual incompatibility of the two. And mm. um, so, th I, I th yeah, th mm. you just go right ahead and talk perhaps about religious fundamentalism. Yeah, might yeah, be religious a good fundamentalism. Um, I mean, yeah, I was with Helen, Helen White and George Mercury Price. That kind of traces out its historical antecedents effectively. But mm. um, I think it's become sort of fossilized uh, in this belief that there's only one possible interpretation of the book of Genesis, and it's my interpretation, you know. Um, and I think that's a bit arrogant, because, mm. and a bit stupid, <coughs> actually, as Christians, because often that also focuses on what I don't think is the major message of Genesis 1. So I think this is something, um, I, I remember I had a, a friend, there was an old blind lady who used to stay with us when she was little, when I was little, and one of her favorite expressions was, Christians are like custard. We get upset over trifles. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and we do. And yeah, you know, in, in Scripture, there are some major, major themes, and there are some minor themes. And yeah. you know, we should major on the majors and minor on the minors. I mean, they're not unimportant, but if we major on the minors, we've got a problem. And if you look at Genesis, the major theme is so exciting. It's yeah. actually so exciting. God created everything. God created man for a relationship with, uh, with him. Uh, man fell, but God instituted a plan of redemption. I mean, that is actually a really, really amazing story. Sure. Um, I was doing an astronomy show last night for some English people, and whenever I do my astronomy shows, I take people on this journey deeper and deeper out into space, and by the time we're finished, if I've done my job properly, 
you're feeling really, really small because <laughs> the distances involved, the sizes of these things, just utterly mind blowing. So I always ask my, my audience at the end, I say, are you feeling small? And they always go, yes, I'm feeling really small. <laughs> I say, are you feeling insignificant? Yes, but you shouldn't feel insignificant, actually, because the creator of this vastness considers you significant. How do we know he considers you significant? Because he flipping well came and died for you. You know, he didn't do that for Beetlejuice or Alpha Centauri. He did <laughs> it for tiny little humans on this spec. Yeah. So he is making an incredible statement that out of all the universe, this vastness, we are actually significant. And the bigger the universe, the bigger God is. You know, it, the, the majesty of the person who created the thing uh, is demonstrated by the size of the thing and the beauty of the thing. When you yeah. look at the Milky Way and all the galaxies and everything, you just go, oh my word, this is just unbelievably splendid. What about the one who made it? You know, he's even more majestic and splendid. Yeah. And he says, I'm significant. He has demonstrated in the most utterly dramatic way, I'm significant. And, you know, I think we've got an epidemic of insignificance in our modern culture, of feeling purposeless, meaning, you know, this technological world we don't understand is running away from us. Um, you know, if we take a purely physicalist view, we're just atoms in the void and there's no purpose and meaning. And you see people really struggling with this. Mm. And Christianity, biblical Christianity, has this extraordinary message that the heavens declare the glory of God and the heavens declare your significance in that. Wow. Uh, well, well, what's, well, well, what's interesting to me is that um, we, 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 in general, if you take the whole thing of time and space, we generally accept the vastness of space, right? I mean, if we can't ignore it. We have all, you know, we have telescopes, we can see that. But in terms of the, the age of the earth in Genesis, we don't accept the vastness of history. You know, we yeah. wanted to be 6,000 years old. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, you know, okay, so we have, we have this vastness of space, but this tiny bit of history, and, and we want to glorify God through that. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. not that it would be, you know, bad if it were like that, but I mean, why not, you know, celebrate the vastness of history as well and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and see the vastness of God and the bigness of God in that? Absolutely. Um, you, you know, uh, season for season, you know, producing and letting beings develop. And, and, and um, until he gave birth to us. I think so. I mean, the, the, the contrary to that would be if the Bible definitely states that the earth is 6,000 years old, then, you know, that settles the issue mm. because I would believe the Bible instead of science. But mm. biblical scholars tell me that's not a good no, way no, of interpreting the Bible. All. You no. know, um, Paul says to Timothy, do your best to present yourself as one approved, a workman who correctly handles the word of truth. Um, and that's actually a challenge. You know, um, I'm reading Corinthians at the moment, and when I come to read Corinthians, I I'm struggling because I don't know any Greek, you know, and I'm also struggling because I don't know that as much as I should about the culture in Corinth and the relationship of the Corinthians to Paul, etc. The more I know about that, the more I'll be able to put the pieces together of Corinthians. And so, mm. you know, a good biblical scholar like yourself, Rudolf, who, you could, who speaks Greek and reads the Greek, you'd do a much better job of me because you know the Greek. Um, the problem becomes, the problem of not knowing the culture and language becomes even more extreme when we go back to ancient Hebrew culture because that language is more of a challenge. Um, that culture is so much more of a challenge because it's so much more divorced from us. Mm. If we're going to understand the minors, now the majors are clear, you know, God made it all, etc., etc. But if we're going to dig into the minors like the age of the earth, which is not really a theological yeah. major, is it? You know, our faith yeah. doesn't really depend on that. If we're going to dig into that, we'd really better do a good job of biblical scholarship on the text. So we need to understand ancient Near East culture. We need to be really good at Hebrew. Um, I was very privileged. We had a, a wonderful biblical scholar um, called Ernest Lucas, who written some amazing books that I thoroughly recommend. He came and stayed with us for two weeks, and we had some great discussions. And when we w went to read the Bible together, I would get out my NIV, and he would get out his Hebrew Bible, you know, and just read it in the Hebrew. And it's like, oh, okay, you know what you're <laughs> talking about. You know, and we need to do, we need biblical scholars to tell us how to interpret, correct, to correctly handle the word of truth when it comes to Genesis. And just to illustrate the issues at stake here, let me give you a, a seemingly trivial example, but I think it illustrates the point. So let's look at Genesis 1. So Genesis 1 as I'm sure you know, uses two words to describe God's creative acts in Genesis 1. There's asa, which is kind of to form or make or, or create, but it's a word that can be used of a human craftsman as well. And then there's bara, which is only used of the creative works of God, isn't used of a human craftsman. And bara is used three times in Genesis 1. The first time is in the first verse, in the beginning God created. 
Well, that kind of makes sense. You know, that's a big deal. The second time it's used is of the creation of humans. Okay, that's a big deal. What's the third one? Well, I'll put you out of your misery. The third use of bara appears in day five of the creation of the sea monsters. Now, you kind of go, what? What's so special about sea monsters? What the heck is that all about? But if you understand ancient Near East culture into which Genesis was delivered, it makes complete sense. Because we, we mustn't forget that pre-Genesis, it wasn't that people had no idea about how creation happened. Mm. There were lots of creation stories. Yeah. They were just all wrong. You know, they were all idolatrous. They were all to do with these massive gods and et cetera, et cetera. And an absolute theme of the pre-Christian, pre-Jewish creation stories was this idea of the conflict of the gods who won, in the good gods, with the bad gods who represented chaos. And in particular, you had the good god had to overcome chaos represented mm. by sea monsters. Mm. And so their god was not like the creator god, we know is actually the truth. He had to fight other deities to establish yeah. and build the earth. So he killed Timat, the sea monster, cut her in half, and with one half made the heavens, with one mm. half made the, the earth, and with yeah. the blood made humans. Mm. You know. um, and so the writer of Genesis coming along and said, you may have heard about those sea monsters <laughs> that the god had to fight to create the world. Forget it. God barred the sea monsters. They're his goldfish. You know, mm. He made those. <laughs> Don't get it wrong. And suddenly, if you put on <laughs> your ancient Neary spectacles, Genesis 1 comes to life. You know, Why in, Genesis, in day 4 does God not, the writer, not mention the sun and the moon? You know, we all say, well, no, he doesn't. Mm. He talks about the greater light and the lesser light. What's that all about? They're mm. perfectly good words for sun and moon. The reason he doesn't is because those were words used in idolatry, used in the worship of, of idols, and he doesn't want to do that. So he wants to make it clear that sun thing you're worshipping, that's just my lantern. You know, mm. that's my big lantern. The moon, mm. that's my little lantern. You my know, these, yeah. th these are not things to worship. They're <laughs> just things I made. And if one looks at it this suddenly, the whole of Genesis one takes on a different light. One can see it as an incredibly powerful polemic against the idolatry that surrounded the the Jews, and in fact the idolatry that was constantly their downfall. I can remember as a little boy in family devotions, loving reading Kings and Chronicles, you know, because mm. those are all the gory bits. And, uh, <laughs> and you'd yeah. start... At the make start nice of, movies. <laughs> yeah, the start <laughs> of every king, it would say, such and such was ruled for so many years, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And he, what did he do? He restored the Baals and the Asterisks. And what happened? Oh, they got punished, you know. And the, the whole story of the Old Testament is Israel being unfaithful to God and running after idols. This was mm. one of the, oh, their biggest challenge. And I believe Genesis 1 is right at the start, God saying, don't do that because I made it all. All those things you want to worship as idols, they're just the created order. Um, okay, so, 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 so what you're saying is, if we don't interpret Genesis the proper way, in the ways it's been written, that creates the conflict, because then we get yeah, in conflict with yeah, science. Yeah, exactly. I remember I was... Uh, uh, doing a thing um, in a very large church here, you know, near us. I won't say the name, but it's you know this way. Um, <laughs> uh, I uh, and don't I don't think that you know. Um, I was talking on Genesis, and I was talking about the poetic uh, nature of Genesis and how powerful this was in, in terms of the you know more or less the terms that you express. And one guy jumped up and he said, "No, no, I made a, he, a, a you know I, I made a study of this." It's, it's not poetic. It's meant to be literal, you know, the day and everything. Um, and I spoke to him afterwards. And, you know, I didn't make a big thing of it in front of the audience, but I invited him to come and speak to me afterwards. And, um, and I asked him, okay, so tell me about yourself. You know, uh, where do you come from? No, I'm this and this and that. So I said, okay, what do you do now? I'm an engineer. I do this and this. I said, oh, okay. So, um, so how long did you make a study of this whole thing? No, I, you know, three to six months, I, put I, I read everything I could read. I did I said, okay, so you're telling me that my professor at Tikkis that, uh, that made this his life to study Genesis, he's not just an Old Testament theologian, he reads the Hebrew Bible like you mm -hmm. said earlier, he was working 40 years of his life on Genesis 1 to 11, that's his field of speciality, uh, he's saying this is, you know, and he loves the Lord by the way, he knows God, he knows Jesus, he says this is, you know, uh, Poetic, and you've done a three-month study, and you said it's not. Mm -hmm. You know, please just, you know, show some humility here. Um, you know, I won't tell you what to do in your field. 
because I don't know it. I might, ha I might have a few ideas, but I'll probably mm. be wrong mm. because it's not my, it's not my field. Mm. Um, so what you're saying is this kind of fundamentalism, you know, creates... So this is where we as Christians really contributed to this yeah, whole... Yeah, absolutely. To this whole absolutely. conflict thing. Uh, and that word humility you use, I mm. think, is very important because, you know, it is... A, a completely possible interpretation of Genesis that it is six periods of 24 hours mm. and it all happens 6,000. That's possible. But it's not the only interpretation. Yeah, and, and of so, course, of course. And it's a minor. So yeah. I think it's common sense. I think and, it's, last time and I and looked, there are about 24 different ways of interpreting Genesis, all mm. by Bible-believing Christians. And at least 23 of them have to be wrong. You know. <laughs> uh, but these are on, on the minors. And, yep. and they're not the majors. And let's major on the major and minor on the minors. And let's discuss sure. the minors. It's very interesting. Let's look at what biblical scholars say about the text that, you know, beyond us, yeah. who haven't been studying it for 40 years. That's but let's not be too <laughs> arrogant about it because yeah. I think it's really important to distinguish between Scripture and my interpretation of Scripture. Because if I look back at some of the sermons I've given in the past, I cringe. No, you me know? too. No, I've no. got it wrong you so many them. times. And we've all got, <laughs> if we're honest, we've all got it wrong. But we really believed that at the time. That was our interpretation. Yeah. But we were wrong. And I'm sure when we get to heaven, God's going to say, Phil, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, really. I love you, but gee. 30% 30, 30 max. You, know? <laughs> yeah. you really missed it. But on the majors, <laughs> yeah. I think we can all agree. You know, and the majors, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a point thin here, but the majors are so wonderful and powerful and mm. such an incredibly powerful message to a world that needs it. Mm. And, and this, to me, is the biggest tragedy that the church is messing around with fighting about who the flippin' Nephilim were, you know. And that's <laughs> not what people want to hear. They're not interested. They, they want to know this message that the creator and sustainer of the universe has demonstrated mm. through dying on a cross for us that yeah. was significant. Yeah. That's really and, and an amazing story. And some of the... Uh, you know the the, uh, the objections that that some fundamentalist Christians have is that we only you know we only start saying that uh, Genesis might implicate a longer time after the development of science. Mm. So we're just talking after the science, but but that's not true. That's not true. The church yeah. fathers like Clement yeah. from Alexandria, yeah. Augustine, all of them. Calvin, Calvin, yeah. exactly, exactly. Calvin, in his and, commentary and on Genesis, he said, yeah. "He who would learn astronomy and other recondite arts." should look elsewhere. Yes. He said, this yes. Is Genesis is not trying to do science. That okay. Was, that was John so, Calvin. So is there another, mm. another reason, beso you know, besides religious fundamentalism, uh, we've already touched on, you know, let's just name it quickly, namely the, you know, the, the second reason for the, in, you know, for the conflict um, besides the, inc the intellectual incompatibility we have had, religious fundamentalism, but, but then also we have the... Um, uh, the non-overlapping magisteria, to, to take Stephen Jay Gould's term, that mm. science has its certain field of study, theology, philosophy have their certain fields of study. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting idea. I wouldn't go 100% with it, because um, what I find so interesting talking to really brilliant Christian scientists is how much they would say their biblical faith has really enriched sure. their science, you know, and their science enriched their biblical faith. So, and, and, you know, the Bible has things to comment on questions of science. I mean, I, I remember seeing a funny cartoon about um, the Big Bang, because for some strange reason, Christians get under, hot under the collar about the Big Bang, you know. Before the, <laughs> bi before the Big Bang, the, the idea, the scientific idea was Fred Hoyle's steady state theory. The universe was eternal, it had always existed, it, nothing was really changing, and consequently, it had no need for a creator because it was eternal. It was unchanging. You know, it's only things that have a beginning that need to have a cause. It's sort of, you know, the Callum argument. So, mm. um, and then, to everyone's surprise, it was like, whoa, it, there was a beginning to this universe. It came into being, you know. Who did that? Um, and I saw this cartoon of this mountain depicted, you know, and these scientists were climbing up this mountain, and they get to the top, and getting to the top is the realization that the universe had a beginning, and on the top, there's a, a, a bunch of theologians sitting there, like, yeah, we could have told you that, you know. In yeah. fact, we did. Uh, it's <laughs> actually entirely consonant with our understanding of in the beginning God created, you know. That mm. doesn't tell us how. It's not, the Bible's not actually that interested in how. Sure. Um, but it does tell us the who, that it was God, and he made it all. Um, okay. And so, I think there is, there is discussion between science and faith, that's actually very positive. And, and I wouldn't go along entirely with Stephen Jay Gould in terms of there's nothing to communicate between the two spheres, but it's not a conflictual discussion. Mm. It's, it's a bit like 
the how the the light thing. You know, the, the, they're both talking about the same thing, and they're both adding. That's the two books of life, like, like Francis Bacon used to say, right? That yeah, the, absolutely. That we have the um, we have the uh, what do you call it? The the, the natural theology. The book of the natural theology. Yeah. You have the book of, book of the of Bible, yeah. and the two those two complement each other, and, and, and that's actually the message of the Bible. Mm. If it's true, like you said earlier, you know, Psalm 19, that the heavens reflect the glory of God, then there should be a kind of dialogue between mm. the two. Absolutely. Um, okay, so, 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 so last question uh, to you. Uh, uh, well, I think you already answered the question somewhat um, that uh, are there respectable scientists who claim to have solved this tension between science and orthodox faith? And of course, you're a living example. So, I mean, here you are. Um, but, but I think if there's only one or two that did that, I, I think that's already a you know, big indicator. And if they solve that respect, you know, respectably, yeah. you know, th then they shouldn't necessarily be. Absolutely. Um, is there anything you want there to are add? Lo there are loads. I mean, one of my heroes is a guy called Dennis Alexander. I don't know if you've ever read his books. Great, great books. He is like one of the preeminent biochemists in, in Great Britain, sits on all the sort of, you know, grant funding boards and everything because he's, he's so eminent. And, and um, he chose to pursue his science in Muslim countries and take professorships in Muslim countries because he wanted to found underground church cell groups while working as a biochemistry professor. And, and he was in um, Turkey uh, founding an underground church and literally had to flee for his life when um, that was disapproved of, shall we hmm. say. And he chose to go to Beirut to establish uh, a group there. And literally, he left Beirut in the boot of an American diplomatic car, again, because his life was in so much danger. But so he's just an amazing guy who's living out his Christian faith in a really <laughs> dynamic way and a brilliant scientist. But he, he's one of many. I mean, South African, we can think of like George Ellis. Mm. Um, George Branch, a friend of mine, amazing marine scientist, amazing guy altogether loves the Lord. Um, if you look at the States, I mean, there's, there's many. Ken Miller, Francis Collins, past head of the NIH, just mm. stepped down. Um, amazing guy, done some amazing, amazing work there. There are, there are lots and lots of brilliant Christians. Um, Juan Massandina, who amazing theoretical physicist, came up with the ADS-CFT correspondence, if that means anything to you. Loves the Lord. Um, th there's lots and lots of Christians who've had no problem with um, not just reconciling, but in enjoying the enhancement that their science gives to their faith and their faith gives to their science. Wow. Wow. Well, so before we close, uh, we, 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 you know, I'm going to allow about 10 minutes for, you know, for, for questions or anything. Uh, you look very, very paralyzed to me. I hope you have something to ask or to contribute. Um, so, Jürgen, if you could just stand ready there with a the mic. Is there anything, anybody that wants to ask a question or make a comment? And, and please feel free to say anything. Uh, you can disagree with us. You can... Uh, uh, just don't get violent, but, but, but you can do anything <laughs> other than that. You can do anything Only or say anything. There's, ra uh, there's nothing prohibited. You can really say anything you like or uh, anything. Uh, anybody over there? Just wait for the mic because of the recording. Uh, I'll just appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you, Jurgen. Thank you. It's just a practical question. Um, the conflict between science and Christianity is also very present in, in our life today yeah. when you look at the COVID pandemic. Okay. And I would love to hear your <laughs> views on that because if you look at in America <laughs> and those places, it's yeah. Christians. Don't polarize. Many <laughs> Christians who resist uh, COVID, they feel it's uh, something created by somebody. <laughs> um, it's imagination, in somebody's imagination, Gosh. and they're against vac vaccinations. I would love to hear your respond to that. Thanks. <laughs> Sure, it's a huge subject um, on which I'm not very well qualified to speak, but I, I think really it's a reflection of a more tragic polarization that has particularly taken place in American society. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, social media has played a role, the, the way people have become siloed in the media information they receive, that you've got this divergence where really now you have two camps who don't like each other and don't talk to each other, and there's certain, um, tragically, they've become certain badges of membership that apply to each camp, you know? And uh, tragically, being anti-vax has become a badge of membership of the right-wing tribe, which has also become associated, unfortunately, with the church. So I think there's a much deeper thing going on. I mean, I don't want to 
um, annoy anyone here unnecessarily, but I mean, things like climate change have also become a badge of membership of, the, of a certain tribe. And on the other side, I think you've got identity politics has become a badge of membership mm. of, of the left and it also has pretty bad results in many ways. So it, it's, it's very scary. Um, it's a kind of slow motion cultural train crash going on in the States and that they're wanting to export as well. So uh, um, I would say with regard to that vaccination, non-vaccination, to me is not so much of an issue as the let's not get siloed, let's not stop listening to the other side, and let's particularly not demonize the other side, which is what's happened in, in America. Let, let's stay open to many opinions. I mean, um, my wife, she listens to Fox News, she listens to CNN, she listens, she really covers the spectrum, you know, and I <laughs> listen to Sam Harris podcast and I li listen to Tim Keller and I listen to uh, Coleman Hughes and I listen to Julia Gallif and I, I try to expose myself to a wide range of views and none of them are 100% right, you know, and, and that hopefully keeps one rounded and as a Christian, we just must avoid demonizing the other particularly. I think that's incredibly dangerous when the other is seen as an enemy and anything that comes from, from that mouthpiece must be evil and wrong because that's not the case. You know, there's actually things that are true being said by both tribes, but neither of them are listening to each other. And somehow the vaccination thing has got sucked up into that. And uh, it's very sad. Yeah, I personally I have become, you know, became very disappointed that the church was so easily mm. polarized mm. because of the whole thing that actually became a spiritual distraction. Mm. Whether you're vax or anti-vax is really not the point, yeah. but that we allowed that to, you know, uh, to disunify us or to uh, br bring this tremendous diversion. And um, anger. Y exactly. And, mm. and I think the more important question is, how do I as a Christian treat someone that doesn't agree with me? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. What does Jesus bring for the two of us? So we should as a church, and before that it was the sexuality debate, right? Uh, are you pro or anti-gay or, or pro or anti-trans or whatever? We must really be careful not to get distracted about... Uh, the polarizations that the media imposes on us, um, we should stay a unity, and that means we can actually disagree about certain things. Mm. COVID is really a distraction. It's not the main mm. thing. Mm. Uh, our unity and our faith in Christ mm. is the main thing. Sorry, I didn't, it's actually your time. Um, yes. uh, yes. Someone yes. else? Uh, thank you very much for that. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Oh, oh this, uh, there, over there. Donkey. It's coming. Yeah, so my question is just, um, how would you answer a non-believer that doesn't or don't want to become a Christian exactly for the reason that Christians can't agree on stuff like Genesis and other issues in the Bible? Okay, um, well, uh, I'd say it's part of human nature, and even Christians are human. You know, unfortunately, a human nature is to use an Americanism, prideful, you know, and, and we get it wrong. And so, thankfully, I think, usually, we can agree on the majors. Um, you know, God created it all. He created man for a relationship with him. And, and I think uh, it would be so good if we could get the message out of the majors rather than we're fighting over exactly how big the ark was, you know, or whatever. Um, <laughs> and whether there's, a, there's a, a model of it somewhere sitting in, on the mountains of, Turkey or whatever, you know, and these things are interesting, um, but they shouldn't be what the world is hearing from the church as being important. We, sh we should really, and I think the world, is, is, from my experience, talking to other scientists, the message they've got is, is very much, as you say, from a lot of the church, they've got the wrong message, that we are squabbling over minors, and we haven't told them the big story, which is the Creator God gives them meaning and purpose in their life. And they're not just atoms and molecules. Uh, there's a noble God who's actually created everything and given his life for them. And that, that is such an incredibly attractive and powerful and necessary message. So that would be actually the single most important point, I think, to express tonight is, as Christians, let's major on the majors because they're really, really good, you know, and they're really, really needed by a world that's suffering from a, a crisis of insignificance. Um, and yeah, let's talk about yeah. the minors in, in sort of a, a congenial way and let's and a humble way. And I could be wrong. You know, this is my interpretation of this verse, but you know, I'm fallible. I could be wrong. 
Um, as soon as we get emphatic, the only way to interpret this is, I think we're on the wrong track, and, and we're building up conflict within, within the body, which is never a, a good idea. Thanks, for a very good answer. Very good question as well. Uh, last one, one, la one last question or comment. Yes, over here. Uh, maybe it's an easy, maybe I should know the answer, <laughs> but um, is there also uh, such tension or conflict between science and other religions? And if not, why? Mm. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, if, in the sense of, um, I think, oh, this gets a bit tricky, but you can look at the Muslim faith in many ways I think as a Christian heresy, because you know it came out of Muhammad's rather misconceived understanding of the Christians and Jews he'd talked to. So obviously many of the same stories appear there, um, just sometimes a bit garbled. Um, so you get, and also, because I don't believe the spirit of God is involved in Islam, all you have is religious legalism. So that's really gonna butt up against science, and, and it does. And, and there are a lot of Muslim fundamentalists who have a major problem with science, um, and there's some interesting, sometimes hilarious publications to try and refute modern science by, by Muslim scholars. But uh, yeah, and I think you'd find the same if you looked at Buddhism and Hinduism or whatever. You know, the earth is not a flat disk riding on the back of four elephants sitting on the top of a turtle or whatever it is. Um, uh, <laughs> that's not generally what the scientific evidence is. So that, yeah, I think all <laughs> interpreting um, religious texts as science is always a bad idea, because that's not what they were intended for, actually. They're meaning documents, not mechanism documents. And if we get that wrong, we can tie ourselves in knots. Cool. Okay, uh, Philip, I really want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I think I uh, speak for all of us when I say thank you so much for your, um, your knowledge, but, but especially your humility, uh, your willingness to engage, um, your willingness to drive all the way here. I mean, he even, he even he wouldn't even uh, tell me what to pay him. He, he was just saying, you know, whatever, you don't even have to. But he drove all the way from the Waterberg, yeah, and I mean, not that that's important, but you know, some people, uh, you know, we just really appreciate um, that, so we're not going to pay you anything. Um, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. That's not true. But, 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 but thank you so much for your willingness and, and your servant-like attitude, and Julie hit uh, you as well. Uh, on the way here, Marie and I just talked, and we just connected so well with the two of you. Uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, Philip and Juliette visited us just before lockdown in 2020. Uh, mm -hmm. Philip preached here, and uh, we also had a really nice engagement, the four of us. So thank you so much for the two of you. And, um, and uh, really, uh, we really um, wish the best for your ministry and for the tremendous work that you're doing. So I'm going to close with a prayer for us, but we're going to uh, generally, you know, uh, mostly pray for you and, and, and for your ministry. Mm -hmm. So let's just close our eyes and let's pray for these two. Our Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we, we humbly come to you tonight and we bow our heads, our lives in front of you. And we just thank you tonight for, for the pursuit of truth, of goodness and beauty in this life. And thank you that it's so clear to some of us that you're the, the origin of these three and that these values really open up life to us so extensively. Thank you for the explanatory power of your gospel, that it explains so much and it reveals so much to us, that it makes sense of us and of life and even of suffering. Thank you so much. And we want to pray as a community tonight for Juliet and for Philip. We want to ask you to, to keep your hand on them, please, and that you would really be with them every step of the way. Thank you so much for the thoughtful and encouraging and inspiring ministry that they have and their way of receiving people there on their farm, showing, him, uh, showing them the, the glory of God and, and having, them, having them look through the telescope and just look at what you've created. And Lord, we, we know as we sit here that there are people maybe here that look at the same evidence and don't see anything else. And we thank you that they could be here as well, even online. Thank you that we can be open, ask questions, and search for truth. Thank you that you're patient with us, with us all. And thank you that you journey with us. And I want to ask you that you would reveal yourself to any one of us tonight um, here or watching on the screen, uh, whether we believe or whether we don't believe.
please reveal yourself to us and help us remain open to search for the things that make uh, life beautiful and make us see you. Um, so be with uh, Philip and Juliet as they travel home uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, let them arrive safely. And again, thank you for them. Bless them. Make their lives fruitful in Jesus' name. Everybody says amen. amen. Let's just give them a nice hand. <clears throat> Thanks again, guys. So we finished with this uh, quarter's Agora. We, uh, you can look out perhaps for the new Agora Cafe, which is going to be online again. And as soon as we can, we will we'll have some live events as well. Okay, so God bless and have a good evening. <laughs>